Okay, we are live. There'll be a little bit of a delay. It's about a minute. Um, so people who are watching at home, they'll be on that just a little bit delay, but we are live. All right. So we'll go ahead and call the regular meeting uh, to order. This is the North Central Texas College Board of Regents meeting held on Monday, May 4th, 21 o'clock. So we'll go ahead and uh, before we get started, I'm going to ask Dr. Wallace to share a few com. Well, let, wait a minute. We better call um, for a quorum first. Sorry. Um, so the let's see. Is Mr. Grime on the phone? Or on the no? Okay. Uh, Miss Morris here. Mr. Hayen here. Carla Metzler is here. Mr. Henderson. Miss Sullivan. Here. Oh, Erica, thank you. And did I hear Mr. Henderson? I'm sorry. Okay. We have established a quorum. Um, so at this point, I will go ahead and turn the meeting over to Dr. Wallace for a few opening comments, please. Uh, just very few comments to just let you know how the meeting is going to be handled via technology today. So I encourage you when you're not speaking to be sure to keep your device muted because we will have a lot of overlap if not careful. Uh, the only folks that are able to participate in the call today as far as interactive are those that have received a uh, an invite, those of you that are in this screen currently. But I do will let you know that the public is able to access this through a posted website through YouTube, I believe, and that is being streamlined with about a minute delay, but that will be streamlined today for our staff, faculty, and public to be able to watch that. But just a few minutes of that, has joined the meeting. Uh, and uh, then we can make sure that uh, as we go along, Ms. Metzler will call things that uh, we may have to take a little bit of extra time to take votes, et cetera, from the board to give plenty of time for that to be heard. Someone has joined the call and we're gonna ask that you identify yourself for purpose of our minutes, please. This is John Grime. Okay, perfect, Mr. Grime, thank you, sir. All right, Madam Chairman, it's back to you. All right, um, the uh, next item on our agenda is the citizens communication. Uh, Sandy, did anyone email in uh, questions or comments that need to be read to the board? No, ma'am. All right, thank you. The next item on our agenda is the uh, Chancellor's uh, COVID-19 response report. Dr. Wallace. So we're going to have kind of a, a more lengthy <laughs> report from me today. And what I'm going to do is sh uh, at share my screen and pull up a PowerPoint for everyone to watch and kind of go through. Uh, when I do that, I don't always get to see your faces, everyone. So if you have questions, please be sure to, to interrupt me. Uh, we've established and gone through this. It's been quite an activity in the last few weeks, to say the least, for our communities and, and everyone involved. And I, I just want to start out today by doing a really huge thank you to so many of our staff, our faculty. Uh, our faculty picked up such a heavy load instructionally by moving from face-to-face uh, -face traditional courses over into online delivery, Plus our staff working at home, you're going to see so much effort has been put into retaining our students and making sure that their needs are met well. And I'll go through that throughout the remainder of this presentation. For those of you watching online today, we will be sure that this presentation is emailed to all of our employees. You can also, it is posted, portions of it was added, but we will make sure that that's accessible to anybody who would like that, uh, just as general overview. I want to appreciate uh, those of you that are joining us today via the technology and through, through YouTube and our channel. Uh, I, I know that a lot of our staff are. I know we have over 140 right now logged in watching. So uh, thank you all for that. Uh, and we hope this serves not only to inform the board, but to inform our constituencies and our employees as well. So um, instruction, I'm going to start with just updating what has happened across the district since March 26th. It's hard to believe March 26th was the extended week, if you remember, between when we started spring break and when we decided to postpone that along with so many other colleges uh, based on the COVID-19 outbreak and to give us distance and time. 
but we have literally been in an, an altered operations plan since March 26th. It's hard to believe we are now in May. Uh, and, and so I'm going to give you a lot of highlights. I'm not going to read for you every line of this because I'm fully aware that there's nothing worse than death by PowerPoint and specifically reading to folks <laughs> that can do that. But I want to highlight some things. Our instruction, again, all of our faculty did an excellent job developing and delivering online instruction. I have to give those to our e-learning department and our IT department. The lift was huge for those folks, and I'm so proud of their work. They took courses that had never been online and put them online. Uh, they helped each other. They supported our faculty. Senate was engaged in that conversation, encouraging uh, Dr. Ledbetter, our Senate president, was very, very adamant about how we can band together, get this done, and I appreciate their efforts. Our career and technical education students began uh, this, this semester with some, uh, some technical programs that just cannot be completed online. Examples of that are welding, HVAC, uh, plumbing, uh, and a lot of our health sciences. As a result, I, I'm proud to say that we look as today, there's only around just a little bit above 400 students with incompletes. Uh, that's a whole lot of sections and a whole lot of students, I understand, but it is uh, manageable and our goal is, as you'll see later in the presentation, to begin the work of completing those students this summer so that they are not uh, lagging behind. But instruction did great work. I'm going to quickly go through all the work that's been done via remote. Uh, the majority of our staff and faculty have been able to and done tremendous work at a distance. We have not had to worry about the work getting done. Uh, and so let me give you just, if you look at this, Daisy Garcia is our director uh, working under student engagement and also she works in the equity, diversity and inclusion department now and just seeing what they've been able to do. We we did one example. I can I can just pull one simple example out. A participant we has left the meeting. with counseling, advising and campus police and other directors to coordinate several virtual sexual events. We did an I Believe You campaign that was out there and participants from across the district did that. Uh, Dr. Del Rio has been working to make sure that there's engagement along with da Daisy online and virtual meetings so that our students don't feel like, okay, there's no student service, there's no student interaction anymore. They've been keeping that up. Uh, they even got 43 submissions for our virtual NCTC's Got Talent competition. So that's just really awesome. I'll let you read the rest of that. We did our Pride Education Advocacy Knowledge uh, that composed a large group of our LGBTQ plus community that did some work online to make sure that they're still engaged. So uh, kudos to Daisy and her team for that work. Malia Clark represents the faculty side and the instructional side of our EDI work, and she has been doing so much to make sure that that conversation continues. We are not abandoning the work we've already set forth with our ATD Achieving the Dream, nor our, our equity work we're working on in EDI. And so iDream continues, the work's continuing. She's engaging our faculty and in its instructional side of the house in those conversations. So we appreciate her work, as you see, has been vast. Uh, graduation's a whole other story. Graduation's something we can have and could have. Uh, believe it or not, next week would have been, and the end of this week, we would have been gearing up for graduation, but we are going to host an online virtual graduation. That works very well. It's been done by other colleges. Uh, our students have the ability to create a slide with our, our supervision, with their picture and their diploma. Their name will still be read. I will make comments. We'll still have a student speech. So it's kind of exciting to know that. Michelle Huggins uh, retooled that. Um, and, in, and honestly, in a very challenging budgetary time, this is going to cost us remarkably less money to host the virtual than normally it costs us to deliver a face-to-face -face graduation. Uh, it's not ideal, but we want to celebrate the accomplishments of our students, and, and this is at least a way for us to be able to do that. So thanks to Michelle. Amy Clone and Tracy Flanagan continue to make sure the Completion Center the Career Center, the Counseling Advising is continuing. Counseling Advising staff has done desk support. They sent, Completion Center sent over 2,900 texts uh, and a 31% response rate. Uh, that 100% reply back to students that they gave that had questions. So we're doing all the things technologically you can do to engage your students and answer their questions. No stone is unturned as far as texting, email, uh, and you'll see here in a moment how we're answering and delivering on phone calls that come into the college, et cetera. But a lot of work there, working toward a push, 
365 registration push, which is important. And uh, we've just uh, begun working that remotely, but our counselors testing completion center folks are doing great work. I noticed the other day that one of our completion center employees, Axel, uh, was received a, a really awesome note via technology to, to just say how much the student appreciated that they had had a pretty rough start in their career path as a result of graduating this semester with us and because they couldn't get in they sent a picture with their their grades and their current <laughs> status to, to him and he was sharing that uh, behind the scenes with some of us the excitement that that student has so we really appreciate their effort we're continuing the coaching outreach model post spring break success coaches are working diligently uh, they've had phone calls and zoom meetings with 204 students you can read the rest of that the early alerts come in we're still following up on early alert uh, we're very pleased to know that there are very virtually no academic incompletes outside of the normal scope. Students were not allowed to drop their courses without first investigating the choices and visiting with a counselor. We didn't want them just to quit because it was online. We wanted them to make a good decision for their future, and they've been very cooperative in that, and that's worked well. Amy Clone, Tracy again, completion center emails to students related to their COVID experiences, what we can do. Counseling has been addressing things uh, through advising at NCTC withdrawal requests uh, were not unmanageable at all. Uh, monthly uh, newsletters, just a lot going on there that you can read about. And we're very excited about that. Uh, again, they they are doing all current NCTC students have access to the group. Uh, they can get in there. 3,500 unduplicated students have already accessed materials for their first for this, uh, this course about navigating and student advising Canvas course. So if there was confusion and you've never been online before as a student, you had the opportunity to learn and bring that curve up to where you'd be successful in your courses. Uh, Dr. Farmer's been doing an excellent job. You know, we're in a position right now where we're unable to test physically our students for admissions and placement. So in other words, PSI's kind of been on, put on hold the, go, uh, the state gave us a little bit of a flexibility for that and dual credit students. However, we wanted to make sure and with D Dr. Farmer's input that we don't just don't test just not the test sake. We want to make sure we're doing our best to get these students in classes they need to be in. And so that is going on continually. We're having some alternate ways in which we test via distance. They've worked really hard to remote proctor these. Uh, and so TSI is continuing uh, to be delivered. Uh, admission is working hard. Uh, we're still processing applications. We're a little bit low on applications as the entire state is. And part of that could be twofold. Number one, our high school students didn't finish their traditional year as they would normally. So if you were a senior, junior, uh, wanting to do dual credit as a junior, et cetera, and you were normally going to apply, you didn't really have that opportunity in the time frame you normally would toward the end of your high school semester. Uh, that would be when counselors would pull you in and say, hey, we're going to apply for college. We're going to get your names out there and get ready. That may be why we're seeing some statewide reductions in applications, but uh, they have been doing a great job under the direction of Jennifer Beal to make sure that uh, JRM is working with training for dual credit. That is our management system. Uh, that's how we're exporting to e uh, EX so that we have one centralized location for our data pools, et cetera. And of course, they're still heavily involved in texting students to complete their admissions uh, and their uh, their application. The main stop, which you've heard a lot about through the last year, as far as our one stop shop, because they're not physically on location, have been doing things to help us manage uh, the outside uh, uh, questions, et cetera. And one of the biggest things they're doing is they're answering every single incoming call that comes to the college. That's a heavy lift in itself. They're doing outreach to text uh, to, through texting. They're doing managing all the admissions emails to help admissions focus on the back door processing. Uh, they've been doing the same JRM process uh, training as, as everyone else, but doing a really good job. Desiree Demange is involved in that along with Ms. Beal, but we appreciate their work. Recruitment is working to manage text to do their conversion of training they're working on trying to get back into schools in new ways, the high schools to recruit our dual credit and our seniors. So they're working diligently to do that, our, our, our recruitment office. Processing center is processing evaluations, uh, processing applications rather. Um, honestly, the processing center is, is very well, well read for distance kind of work. 
their work is really behind the scene and is computer based. Uh, and you'll see later, or we can go ahead and say now that we have already currently spent right at $100,000 in additional laptops and computers uh, due to COVID-19 to issue to our own staff just so that they were able to work. Uh, and we'll talk about that under Dr. Miller's financial report a little later. Do uh, Diane Rother in our library and her team doing great work to just transition a lot of the training and a lot of the things that they would normally do, they've transferred to that online and through social media. Uh, really happy that uh, one of our, uh, you know, Michelle does a lot of blog for the library. If you've never seen those, they're pretty awesome. I'm just gonna tell you, she's doing those and trying to keep students uh, really knowing how to locate accurate and, and do timely research, even though they're at a distance. So I brag on all of that team uh, and their work. Marketing public relations uh, early April decided we needed to transition our marketing plan from a traditional enrollment status to uh, something along the lines of go ahead and don't stop and get ahead even though you're online. So you're going to see these kinds of things even in the into the fall as our recruitment and our public relations marketing. Uh, there's still going to be a heavy emphasis on online education we believe by the state. Uh, just for protection uh, as we enter the fall to keep folks healthy. If we do see a resurgence of COVID-19, we want to be able to say that we're still prepared to be online. And so our faculty are moving that way under their department chairs, the deans, and Dr. King is our interim provost, working hard to make sure that we're prepared for that. One thing I would say as you look through these new uh, marketing tools, uh, we are also trying to encourage students not to stop out. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in the next few moments. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that uh, there was some surveys that were done by the Texas Association of Community Colleges in the last few months, and we uh, investigated student plans, and we were able to survey about 27,000 students in the state of Texas. And the concerning numbers are those uh, in the 40 percentile, 40 to 44 percent of students that were engaged in that survey are concerned about being able to finish and or even uh, return in the fall for uh, courses. So we don't want our students to feel left alone. When we report in a minute on our COVID-19 uh, CARES funds, we'll kind of give you insight into what we're doing. But public relations has been pushing hard. Social media, stay at home, get ahead. I've got a job, I need a career. You can start. The majority of our career and technical education programs can start online. Uh, and so we're encouraging students to really participate in that. So great work by Ski Sullivan. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Diane, uh, everybody, I'll forget. There's just a huge team of people that have been working on that. And so we really appreciate it. You can see all the different soft skills, Focus, Future Focus magazine goes into print and online in an app. That's all about uh, the work we're doing. And it's a brilliant publication, as you can see, and really looks good. Grants Department, the Perkins Biennial Report was submitted. Uh, things are a little delayed, uh, as to be expected on a federal and state level, but uh, Donna Updergrove and all of our coordinators for our grants have been working diligently to keep up with that. Pathways to Credentials Grant, you will hear from us in the next coming month. Uh, and we're probably gonna request Madam Chairman a June uh, board meeting because of the nature of what's going on in the last few months. We just need to keep you all informed. We have some grants that we're attempting to make sure that the staffing and the importance of those grants, although some of the funding is ending, that the services, we're doing our very, very best to make sure that the services that will not be impacted negatively for our students. But uh, you can see the, uh, the wonderful work uh, that has been done. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, later on about uh, some of the funds that CARES Act is gonna provide for us. Uh, development and alumni have been working diligently. Uh, I will say this, and Debbie can chime in if you have questions toward the end, but our foundation's been integral in this and our alumni have given, our staff have given to the foundation and, and really stepped up to say, hey, we know people are struggling right now. How can we help? And so as a result, we've seen uh, approximately $66,000 given out of the foundation for students in needs. Uh, we are going to be discussing under our CARES Act fund uh, how much we're giving toward the foundation to help disseminate through application to students that may not have received the first portions of that CARES Act funds we've already delivered. If they have extra expenses or they, they need some help, uh, I have to applaud uh, Brian and Debbie and all the work in the foundation. 
they have done such a heavy lift to help our students and they're getting some wonderful stories. And let's face it, folks, this is one of the best ways we have to make sure our students know we truly do care and they, they tend to come back to us when we help them. It helps us and it helps them as well. So we are proud of that work. Uh, you can see some of the technology they're using to uh, connect with alumni uh, and it's been really great. The Small Business Development Center. Now, this is related directly to uh, COVID-19. As a result of that, if you if you remember, we are a part of a larger uh, SBDC movement, but we are the North Texas Regional for Denton, et cetera. We have uh, received an additional 460,000 in funding as a result of COVID-19. And that was uh, asked by our funders to get four additional SBDC advisors through September of 2021 to provide support to small business. We've heard over and over from our, our business partners and community leaders the importance of helping small businesses be able to retain their futures during this pandemic. Uh, we're seeing an increased amount of PPP uh, applications. Uh, and so we are really excited to see that they're doing that. And by the way, during the first half of our fiscal year, our SBDC assisted small business clients in creating 23 brand new businesses, 135 jobs, and over 10 million in capital infusion. That's just in the first half of the year. So my, I really applaud their work as well. So CARES Act, what does that mean? What does it not mean? You've heard so much about it. It, it is uh, not as straightforward as it may have sounded, uh, and there's a lot of mixed message. Uh, we coordinated a district-wide calling campaign to outreach our currently enrolled students. As a result, uh, there were over 50 team members, including faculty staff, that assisted with that outreach. We have received, uh, to date, uh, we have received 1.9 million over, a little over, in CARES Act student share funds. We have distributed and begun the distribution of 1.593 million uh, over to 2,655 CARES Act eligible students. They receive $600 each based on their EFC level. The EFC level has to do with the, the amount of money they earn per family that gives them the ability to go to college. So what I would tell the board, and it's important for you to understand in our communities is, this was not just Pell eligible students receiving it, although they did. It's that, that middle group that just doesn't quite fall into Pell, but also needs support. Uh, and that's who we've awarded that to. There were very strict uh, rules about who could receive these, who couldn't. You had to be registered at a certain point of time. You had to be, um, you, it did not work. We were not allowed to award any of this to dual credit students. We were not allowed to uh, award any of this to students if they, for example, were fully online to begin with and didn't experience some kind of change due to COVID. So there was a lot of restrictions. That's why you see uh, we're still fortunate, but we, we serve 2,655 students as a result of that. 338,000 is going to be awarded to the emergency aid application process, and that is being uh, managed by our foundation office, by Debbie and her staff. Uh, that's helping additionally with food, housing, child care, and, and there's a separate application part process for that embedded in my NCTC for our students to apply. And the beauty of that program is it doesn't necessarily matter if you've got the COVID-19 funds you could, or the CARES Act funds, you could still apply for some of these if you need help. And so we encourage our students uh, to look into that. I can't tell you enough about the IT and e-learning departments. They have worked, I mean, tirelessly. Uh, and it has been a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job. Denise and her team, I have to applaud you. I have to applaud uh, all of our e-learning special groups. Uh, I mean, that's Levi, I, I think his name is Levi. I'm going blank almost. And then uh, Becky, uh, those that have just worked. I know uh, Sarah Flew, she's been very involved in helping as well as Dr. King. But 50 health science testing laptops were, were administered to use for students and, and our own business offices, student affairs and business offices. We've also had to acquire as a result of this several Chromebooks that we've issued to students because they may not have had resources to be able to utilize um, to go online. I mean, there's just a lot of infrastructure in some of our rural counties that, that we serve don't have internet accessibility like they used to or like we need them to. And so the problem with that was we also went ahead and installed some wireless access points to our campuses where a student could at least drive up to the campus, download assignments, et cetera, by our Wi-Fi without having to enter a building. So you can see the list 
of things. We've added web EX to these meetings to everyone. Uh, and it's, I just got to thinking it's Lee and Becky in <laughs> e-learning. I knew it started with an L. Okay. Um, but uh, just a lot of work there and we're so proud of that. So those are the things we have diligently worked on. That is a lot. I want to ask if there's any kind of uh, of question before I, uh, you know, before I go on on that report, and then we can go from there. But um, that's a fast, down and dirty uh, version of all the hard work that's been done. But any of the board that may have a question, be glad to answer those at this time. Madam Chairman, that is my report, and our next uh, agenda item would be reports from the region. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Uh, the next item is uh, committee reports, and uh, on the, I'll make the executive committee report at this time. On April the 28th, uh, the executive committee met, uh, the, and uh, Dr. Wallace provided us an update on the college's COVID-19 response, including the operational plans currently in place during the pandemic. The numbers of students um, with incompletes, uh, very much of all the things that you just heard in the report that he provided. Um, and uh, we will file that for a uh, full board uh, presentation there. The next one uh, would be the finance committee. Um, Ms. Morris, do you have a report? The finance committee um, at April 30th, we discussed the uh, current financial situation and the things that occurred to get us to that point. Um, we reviewed the steps the administration is taking to uh, mitigate any of those budget issues. We covered the CARES uh, Act funding, which Dr. Wallace discussed. Um, we, we talked about a summer tuition discount, which will be an action item a little bit later. Um, and then we reviewed the normal monthly financial reports. Okay, thank you for that report. The next item on our agenda would be uh, the reports to the regents, and the first one is the financial report. Uh, Dr. Miller. Yes, Chairman Messler, thank you. Um, we have our typical monthly reports here. The thing that's a little unusual about it is that uh, here we are in May, but the financials you have are for March, so they're already a month old. And then we have also included uh, the second quarter investment report, which now is actually two months old, but uh, because we didn't meet in March or April, this is the first opportunity to get those out to you. So um, that's the materials that you have in your report. And as always, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. What I really wanted to take advantage of here in this time frame was rather than looking back I wanted us to look forward and focus on the unique environment that we're facing today. And I'm actually going to go back and start in August because it was in August that that the board approved a $67 million budget as was presented by the administration. And there, there was a significant increase in the budget and we were anticipating significant increases in revenues because um, of tuition and fee increases. We, we base that budget on level enrollment, but uh, a significant bump in tuition and fees. So we, we were using that to fund the increase in the budget for the next year. And then after the semester began, we got into September and we found out that at that point, our enrollment was down almost 9% over the previous year. So right off the bat, we realized that we were going to have um, some concerns with the budget, but we kind of held off because we went to this new structure with for classes, particularly in, in Denton, uh, of eight week classes. So we expected to be down somewhat when we started the fall semester because a lot of students were only taking half as many classes when they registered in August and the other half of their classes were going to be beginning in October. And sure enough, when we moved into November, at least half of that decrease in enrollment was regained through our, our growth in second eight week classes there at the end of the fall. But 
we were still down about four to five percent over the previous year. So let's move forward from there. And, and here's where when we got into January, that's when our, our audit came in. And those of you that may remember that, that initially there was about a five million dollar decrease in our bottom line um, on that audit, but that we had to take that with a grain of salt because a good portion of that had to do with change accounting changes from Gatsby. It had to do with these post-employment benefits that had never been reported before. And there's questions to the extent the college actually truly has a liability, but all colleges had to start reporting this. And so it wasn't unusual to have a negative impact on the bottom line. But as after the auditors left and we started looking at our numbers, we quickly realized that even with that $5 million reduction, Gatsby took care of more than, accounted for more than half of it, but we still found ourselves truly down almost $2 million at the end of the previous fiscal year. So you look at those two things in tandem, our starting point in uh, September 1, we didn't attain the same level of enrollment. There was a drop. And we didn't even end the previous year with a balanced budget. We actually ended the previous year with somewhat of a deficit. So those two things compounded to create uh, some budget concerns and executive council immediately started working on this. We, we made moves to reduce the current budget by one and a half million dollars. Uh, by cutting capital purchases, travel, and, and some, some various things. But, and we had, as we were starting our budget in February, we told all departments to find a minimum 5% reduction uh, in their budgets for the upcoming year. So that's where we began the budget process. And, and Dr. Miller, I'm, I don't want to interrupt too too hard, but I'd like to say I'm really proud of the efforts. We, I mean, our folks did a wonderful job in every department of reducing that 5%. They were on board to make that happen. And so I do have to say there was a lot of hard work and we came in at that, having met that goal prior to uh, what you're going to see as a result of the last few months. But I just wanted to say that that was a heavy lift from every department. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we get to March and then this ugly little creature rears its head into our uh, world. And so as we get into March, we extended our spring break by a, a week that allowed us to prepare for all online instruction. And it also allowed a lot of the back staff, like in the business office in my area, it allowed us to prepare our people to be able to work for, from home. And again, like Dr. Wallace said, IT did a wonderful job getting us outfitted so we could do that. And so by the end of March, we were ready to go. And the big thing that happened during April was the, the federal government's offer for federal assistance, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, the college is going to receive approximately $4 million in CARES Act funding. But remember, about half of that is passed through because half of that has to go directly to the students. It was just last week with those $600 uh, stipends to uh, 2,700 students. But there is going to be some money for the college, 1.9 million for institutional assistance. That allows us to be reimbursed for a lot of out-of-pocket expenses that we've incurred because of uh, the pandemic. And it it really, it will be of a great assistance for us. There's a lot of IT expenses we have already incurred that we need to incur in order to facilitate this all online uh, structure that we find ourselves in today. 
And I would add to that, uh, we have to see that institutional assistance is really an, a reimbursement um, for our expenses associated directly with COVID. There's some restrictions there on being able to, to move that into like salary lines. We can't do that with any kind of, uh, you know, executive level salaries can't be paid out of this director dean kind of things. Uh, we can reimburse ourselves. And so we're looking at using these funds for things like firewalls that are important and our cybersecurity uh, upgrades. And we don't, we can't publicly go into a lot of those because of the nature of their securities. But uh, those are some of the expenses uh, that are associated with those monies. So we want people to understand that those monies are really reimbursement heavy uh, for us to, because Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Miller, we're probably already, ladies and gentlemen, at about a million dollars of expenses due to COVID at 19, just on the IT side of the house. Right, that, that's, that's very close. And then my final slide, Dr. Wallace and I were just told last Friday by our colleagues at TAC that all state agencies need to be prepared for a potential 15% cut in state appropriations uh, for the coming year. And honestly, it, from my standpoint, I will be pleased if they hold off until the next fiscal year, because I, when this happened about a decade ago, they basically informed us in the spring that we would not receive our last two payments in the month of July and August. And, um, I would, I would hope the state is able to fulfill those obligations through the end of this fiscal year um, because that brings us to the point now that I, I've told you all this to let you know what we are facing as we are working on preparing our next budget. And we really have some immense challenges in front of us, but we're working diligently at Ev looking at everything. We're looking at every revenue item, every expense item, and trying to find where we can uh, make sacrifices to allow us to move forward, but allow us to move forward and still able to all do our jobs as they need to be done. So I would like to take just a moment to sort of give the board where these challenges are lying. We, we hope and we trust that our bet our worst case scenario planning ends up as a best case situation toward the end but we are going to see significant cuts if we receive that 15 percent cut in appropriations one of the things i think uh, i i don't want I'm, I'm not trying to be pushy here but i want to remind the board it, when the board began prior to my coming under uh, Dr. Hadlock's leadership, really did a good job, all of them, at planning for such a time as this. That was the original intent when they began the rainy day fund and the board discretionary reserves. It was a notion of, uh, and, and I'll be honest, most community colleges in the state, if they didn't already have reserves, began that in 2006, 2000 and some of those because that was when, uh, as Dr. Miller mentioned, they actually took money during a academic year. During a year, they said, we're not going to be able to send you the remainder of your appropriations check. So I, I say that to say these are times when those things happen that we will, the staff uh, will be looking at and making recommendations to the boards on where we use discretionary and where we don't. Uh, we are doing our very, very, very best. And this is going to be difficult. And I want to be honest because so many of our faculty and staff are watching. It is going to be very, very difficult, but we are doing our best to make sure that we do not have to, and we are hoping that we don't have to move toward a RIF or furlough or layoff, but we are unsurmountable in the amount of all at once cuts we are experiencing. This is not any one of these would have been difficult in a given academic year or in one budget cycle. But when you deal with enrollment decrease, COVID-19, and possible state cuts, those are three huge hits. So um, there will be a reduction in next year's budget. There has to be for us to be safe and feel comfortable. But I want our folks to realize we're doing our best to make sure that uh, we treat our people with the dignity and respect that they deserve uh, and doing our best to uh, 
to work with these parameters, but uh, you're going to see a very tight budget next year uh, just so that we can prepare. And then we hope and uh, pray that our enrollments are where they need to be to where we can then retool and say, listen, enrollments up. And, and, and I would say this too, there's often a question I get about recessionary periods or where we see increased enrollments in community colleges, and that is very true. Uh, in fact, we are working on a statewide conversation about garnering jobs through CTE programs, et cetera. Uh, we've had phone calls with the Lieutenant Governor and others. I, I wanted to be careful though, because our problem is not typical. We normally have a recession and we can bring people into a classroom and we can bring them into a lab and we can bring them into health science and be able to retool them and give them good career paths. Our concern here is what will we be living with in the next six months as far as social distancing? Will classrooms be allowed to house as many as they once did? Probably not. Are we sitting here today with every clinical site that we use saying you can't, can't come? Yes, we are. We are literally sitting here today with our clinical sites saying we can't allow your nursing students in and we won't reevaluate that till August. Those are tough decisions and tough times for our students and our faculty. And so we want to just make sure that everybody realizes that um, we're really working hard to make this happen. It will be a very tight budget, but then, you know, if typical recessionary times we have increased enrollment, we, we may see that, but it may be spring before we see some of those things. And so we're taking it a day at a time and being conservative. I know that Dr. Uh, Miller and both and myself, if anyone are able open for questions, uh, Madam Chairman, if you have any. Uh, are there any questions for Dr. Wallace or uh, Dr. Miller? Okay. Thank you very much for the report. We appreciate it. Thank you. Then uh, I, I want to go back. I had forgotten because I knew uh, Mr. Ott was not going to be able to join us today. So I forgot to call his role, but just for the purpose of the minutes, I wanted to make sure that we captured that. Um, all right, the next item on our agenda would be the uh, consent agenda items. Um, are there any items on the consent agenda that we need to remove to discuss independently? Okay, uh, without any of those items being brought forth, we will take a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Make a motion to, to approve the consent agenda. A motion by Mrs. Morris, do we have a second? I'll second that motion. A second by Ms. Sullivan, additional discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please respond nay. All right, so motion was approved. All right, the next item on our uh, um, agenda is the discussion and possible action. The first item is the consideration and possible action for a summer course student in, uh, incentive that will be presented by Dr. Miller. Let me take myself off of mute. Um, as we look uh, at the upcoming term, you know, that with a great deal of uncertainty, our environment that that's changing from day to day um we really want to do what we can to help our summer enrollment um there's an option, and i believe rightfully so that enrollment down for the summer most community colleges across the state are expecting that participant has left the meeting i can honestly say from my standpoint as cfo I'm less concerned about summer enrollment than I am fall enrollment. Um, our typically our summer enrollment generates less than 10% of our total tuition and fees for the year. So being down in the summer is not going to be a, tr a huge harm for us like it will be if those students are not here in the fall. 
And so what we had discussed as a possibility to help bolster, to help fall enrollment, is let's try to keep these students in enrolled during the summer. If they stop out, if they drop out, they may never come back. So um, I had seen some other universities are looking at doing things like this for this summer. So we thought, let's give a discount for summer enrollment, summer only, not for the fall, but just for this summer term. And we're looking at $50 an hour uh, per student. So, you know, th th this, is, this is something that would, if, if we ended up with flat enrollment for the summer, yes, we would lose dollars because we're gonna lose 25%, um, roughly 25% of our, in, in, uh, tuition dollars for those summer students. But I would rather lose that during the summer and have those students stay in classes and still be here in the fall when, when our fall classes begin. So um, that's what we are proposing. Um, it, we're, we're ready to push this with a marketing uh, blitz, if you want to call it that, you know, to promote this with our students, to promote it in the community so that we can help keep those enrollment numbers up during the summer. And hopefully that will carry forward and benefit us for the fall semester as well. And, and Chairwoman, I would add this. I have to say thank you very much to our faculty, uh, our faculty senate, our chairs, our deans for a really robust conversation that occurred over the last few weeks. Uh, as you notice, we're reflecting that we will be paying our overload rate that is typical, or our adjunct rate at 590 a semester credit hour. Normally, we use a formula fund that pays our full-time faculty at a higher rate during summer work. We did this about 20 years ago. They put this in place to incentivize our full-time faculty for, for being involved in the summer. Uh, it, it, it was a hard conversation, but I appreciate that we ended maybe not in total agreement in every piece, but with an understanding and that's enabling us to do a little bit of uh, further uh, thoughts along keeping students engaged. Our desire is to keep the students that are currently enrolled at, at least 4000 of them enrolled this summer, because that's what we would be uh, had last year uh and enable us to keep them engaged to where they don't stop out in the fall because that is our importance and i remind you also this is a base year so anything that we're getting this year is going to determine our appropriations for the future year and even if there's a cut it will it would aid us in having more contact hours and that is also worth a whole lot more as dr miller said than perhaps losing a little bit of the tuition and fee we would have normally garnered is those contact hours for further reimbursement All right. Um, thank you for that information. And I guess if if the board so chooses, we would need a motion to approve the uh, incentive as presented by Dr. Miller. Thousand dollars initially, it looks that way, but because of our instructional costs that are going to be lower this summer and because of some savings we have already been incurring because we're not on campus. We have had savings and those savings will continue. So I, that will alleviate some of that loss of revenue uh, from the cheaper tuition. Okay, I would just want to, I would just wonder is $300 gonna stop somebody? I mean, I'm just philosophically, uh, just more of a curiosity. So, uh, Dr. Miller, I might respond to that just a bit if it's okay. Sure. The survey I mentioned earlier from the Texas Association of Community Colleges uh, that was pretty good sample size considering, uh, and of that population of 27,000, about 500 were ours. What we found in that survey is 45% of our students across the state said they could not fi fi find $500 in the next two weeks if they were if they had to. So they can't get access to credit or cash in the equivalency of 500. So yes, sir, the very students that are at most risk for not completing their degrees, I do believe that $300 makes a huge difference to them. Okay.
You might need to unmute. Thanks. And, and I would also mention, uh, Madam Chairman, that this is for traditional students. This isn't, for example, for dual credit students. This is for your traditional a uh, student that would normally either be on our campus or be online that is a traditional student. This, this isn't a further reduction to already where we've reduced some tuition and fees. Right. Additional discussions? Questions? All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, please say nay. Motion carried. Thank you. All right, the next item under um, discussion and possible action is the uh, discussion of personnel, and I believe that's presented by Kay Schrader today. I don't know if Kay is still logged in. Kay, are you still with us? <laughs> Okay, can you hear me now? There we go. There you are. Good. Sorry, I had myself muted. You have a faculty member that has resigned included in there, and we also included, I believe, a staff person that had resigned in the spring. All right, so uh, we would need a motion to approve those resignations. We accept those resignations. Motion by Mr. Hayen. Do we have a second? Second. Was well, that Mr. Grime? Yes, ma'am. Uh, motion by uh, it was made by Mr. Hayen, second by Mr. Grime. Additional discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carried. Thank you. I think, do we have a, um, a new hire as well? Uh, not that the board has to approve. That was for information only. I remind the board that you only approve contract employees. We just provided this for you. Just uh, we had some resignations that we just provided you, but you do not have to act on those, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. All right, the next item on our uh, agenda is executive session, and we do not have a need to have an executive session today. Um, that would be kind of interesting as to how we would do that. <laughs> that would be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll cross that bridge if we need to, right? So uh, today we do not have the need for that. And so at this point in time, the next item would be. I move we adjourn. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Mayan. We have a second. I'll second it. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, Madam Chairman, just before we conclude, I would tell you that 202 people joined us today. So we really appreciate that uh, for our staff and our communities that joined us. Thank you. Everybody have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.